doesn't exist. As the proverb says, tomorrow never comes. There is no such thing as tomorrow. There never will be. Because time is always now. Welcome to the Philosophical Minds Podcast, the podcast about the stuff we wonder about and other things. All right. I am here with Doug Gabriel, author and anthroposophist, a brilliant human. Um, I became aware of you through my connection with Brian Leto, another amazing soul, and started watching a few of your lectures. And wow, I was really impressed. You go really deep into all the things I'm interested in. Um, so this is definitely um, an honor to have you on. Um, so yeah, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. And any friend of Brian's, a friend of mine, he's quite an alchemist, that guy. Yes, he is indeed. <laughs> Maybe if you could please um, elaborate a bit more in depth on your background and maybe just tell us a little bit about um, your background and yourself in general. Well, <clears throat> I guess I've been through a few incarnations uh, this time around in just this life. I uh, trained in religion and uh, eventually was uh, made a priest in the Catholic Church and got degrees in comparative religion, philosophy, a doctor of divinity. And uh, I also was in the National Security Agency. I went into the Army Security Agency and I became a cryptologist and a systems analyst. And when I got out, I became a Waldorf teacher. And for many years, I was a Waldorf teacher trainer and a Waldorf teacher. And I studied Rudolf Steiner's anthroposophy and um, basically then became superintendent of one school district after the next. And now, um, basically, I'm retired. You've written 13 books. Uh, my wife tells me more than 125 articles and more than 750 podcasts. And we continue to basically produce what we can do in terms of finding truth everywhere we can find it and putting it out on her blogs, aimfortruth.org, um, all kinds of different uh, sites. She's now up on Gab, and she... Um, it's basically the brains of the operation. I just, uh, I, I'm the muscle. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about your necklace. I feel like there's some significance to that. Well, my friend John Barnwell and I do a lot of shows and he was wearing a bolo and I got bolo envy. So I got me a bolo. You know, I'm from the Ozarks from Springfield, Missouri, down there where the hillbillies live. And they don't like to wear ties, so they wear a bolo and steady. And, you know, I couldn't find anything else that would actually show up and look as if I was official and wearing a tie, because for all my life, I've been wearing a tie most of the time. So it's just a way to look a little bit more formal. Cool. And it's, well, a, like it's an onyx. It, it's a, I mean, excuse me, it's an agate. It's no big deal uh, in terms of its energy or anything like that. Cool. Well, I want to start off, I want to especially get into like ether dynamics, um, the cosmic formative forces of cosmos, earth and man, so to speak, um, and the heterochronic nature of the four ethers, and then kind of beyond the four ethers, there's seven. Um, and I'll, that's really cool, because I hadn't really come across that until I was listening to your work. So, so yeah, maybe we could kind of lay out um, the ethers and talk a little bit about each one of them and how the interplay between them. That's beautiful. You used heterochronic uh, reference, which uh, just the other day I was looking for a word that would describe what happens with the ethers, you know, warmth ether, light ether, sound ether, life ether, and the way they build on one another and the way that the ethers are actually talking about incarnations of the earth. So if you were looking at the Kant Laplace theory, you'd say, you know, that there's this magical invisible hand that stirs things until it creates a spiral. And then as you, cause I know I looked at some of your amazing um, videos where you were talking to brilliant people. So uh, I'm sure that you're a brilliant mind that understands these things. So then these uh, nested spirals basically then became what Rudolf Steiner calls um, warmth spheres or he calls it uh, like mulberries. If you looked at a mulberry, you would see these warmth spheres. That's how it all got started. So warmth 
of course, then in that particular incarnation, he gives these funny names for it. So you could talk about these, and I won't be referencing them again so much, but just talking about the first, second, third, fourth levels. But he called them ancient Saturn, ancient sun, ancient moon, and now we're on the earth. And so the three ethers finally came to rest where we're at and created our whole physical manifestation um, through this process of laying down these substratas basically in time and space and then in between each one of them as the ancient hindus believe there's manvantaras there's these great cycles of creation and then there's pralayas where they go to sleep well it's kind of like a butterfly as a matter of fact if you look at the monarch butterfly it actually has the same type of stages that we see here in the earth in relationship to the ethers so they started off with warmth ether now, all of this can be found in one of our books called The Eternal Ethers, uh, A Theory of Everything, because I'm sure you know, talking to some of the brilliant people that you have interviewed, that what we need is a theory of everything. And without that, it's just basically guessing. So Einstein, you know, gives us this, these theories of light, but the theories of light have an a priori assumption that there's the luminiferous ether. And without the luminous ether, there would be no propagation of light. But then everything that he said after that is, is highly um, questionable to begin with. But we do know that basically science would admit that without warmth, there would be no life. And you need these three prior stages of warmth, light, sound ether, which has many names called number ether, valence ether, it has so many names. Basically, it's the things that hold everything together. And then the life ether. Now, you could also refer to the life ether as gravity, per se. And the sound ether and the life ether are gravitational forces, forces that work towards the center. Warmth and light ray out. They could be called levity. So you have to have a balance between these two. But as you just pointed out, there are actually more than four ethers and that you would know that and that you're that sharp is just amazing to me because most people won't recognize that there has to be a substance in which even these ethers are formed. And that substance is Akashic. It's called the Akashic ether. Uh, Irvin Laszlo, one of the great minds of our time has written a book called um, the Akashic ether or the, uh, it's the A theory, and it is the theory of everything, and it does encompass those four ethers. Now, warmth ether is not quite fire, because you can have warmth without having fire. You can have warmth without having all the characteristics of heat or uh, thermal changes, temperature changes. So warmth itself is the transition element between one ether and the next. And when we say ethers, that's different from elementals or elemental beings. It's a little bit different than what you, the Greeks said was the, sub, the, the thing that held it all together. Warmth, uh, you know, the four, uh, the four substances, uh, earth, water, air, and fire. And earth being really, uh, that's, these are also the ethers, but not quite technically. And then there's the elements or what we'd call elemental beings. So the fire or warmth, ether, one could say is the realm of what they call, the alchemists would call um, salamanders. Well, it isn't technically a salamander per se. Uh, it is making reference to the fact that these beings who are amphibious uh, can uh, live in water, they can live in air, they can live uh, in this warmth, they can handle tremendous amounts of warmth. And so, you know, whether you're talking about warmth ether and a salamander, light ether, uh, and the sylphs, or water, uh, the substance water, or the ele elemental water on, on undines or ondines, um, you, and then gnomes being, of course, the earth. Those things are actually quite separate, and they're still the key factor. And warmth is, is one of those elements that we must understand doesn't only manifest as a physical element that Kant Laplace says just happened because things started to move. Well, the question is, who made it move? Who's the first mover? And that's really the essential question. And then what we would have to find out is, is it a force or is it a being? 
And this is what the whole theory of everything based upon the ethers is about. Warmth, light, sound, and life are beings, what we could call hierarchical beings like Dionysius of the Areopagite, uh, uh, Johannes of Sponheim, and all these people talked about the elementals. They talked about these beings standing behind the elementals. Um, you know, Paracelsus wrote entire books on this. Uh, but basically, you need to find out who these beings are in relationship to the human being. Because whether you're talking about the four ethers or the fifth ether, Akasha, or the sixth and seventh ether, which in religious terms are oftentimes referred to as the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, all seven of those ethers are found in the human body. Because I'm a big follower of Rudolf Steiner's teachings, and he said there's nothing in the cosmos that cannot be found in the human body except for comets. And that's a separate discussion, but comets um, basically come out of the Oort realm, uh, Oort sphere, and they appear out of nowhere. They come in, they, they defy most of the uh, laws of physics, and then go back there and disappear. That's a little bit different. But when you're talking about warmth, light, sound, and life, you could re really track exactly which beings created those, which beings donated the substance, which beings found their own awakened consciousness in that substance at that time, and then how that is handed on from one Manvantara to the next Manvantara to the next Manvantara to the time we're in. So we're in the fourth stage. And according to this theory, there are seven dimensions, but these dimensions are the ethers, warmth, light, sound, and life. But you don't keep adding this content. You, in fact, dissolve the content so we're in the realm of earth now, the fourth stage. And the next stage, the fifth stage of the dimension is basically to move into, of course, most people would acknowledge this, uh, moving out of time into the realm of duration. So when that happens, you move into the fifth dimension and that is a transformation of the sound ether. When you move uh, into the sixth dimension, it's a transformation of the light ether. And in fact, it's a dissolving, in a way, a dissembling of these substances. And when you move into the seventh dimension, you are actually transforming warmth ether. So it's often shown as what they call the bathtub, or it's this uh, bell curve. It starts with warmth, light, sound, life, and then fifth, sixth, and seventh. And then when you return to where you came from, it is a realm that cannot be imagined by the human consciousness. It is completely beyond anything that we can think, feel, or will, but it is still part of us. And in fact, once you understand this cosmology of Rudolf Steiner's, which is taken from the ancient Hindu cosmologies, um, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, the, one of the founders of modern theosophy, also talked a lot about this. And you'll find all of these in the book that, we, that I'm referencing. And it's free online, by the way. You can get all of, uh, well, at least four or five of our books for free in PDF form, uh, it's really, it's beyond time and space. And we are in a realm of time and space. And as soon as you leave this realm, you become timeless through, through basically understanding that time is a passage in space. And that's what Einstein was trying to tell us with his theories. Once you leave the realm of space and you move into a timeless realm, the realm of duration, you leave space behind. One could even say the mineral realm. So right now, what we're trying to do as human beings in the process of ascension is to take these elements, understand where they came from, understand that they're in ourselves and use them as a process like the prodigal son to return where we came from. And so warmth is that transition element between all the ethers. As a matter of fact, they say in the ancient, uh, in ancient Upanishads, uh, in, in the uh, Puranas and uh, in uh, all the different Hindu philosophies, that akasha is, there's four elements, or the four ethers, warmth, light, sound, and life. But the akasha can go in between each one of them. And every time there's an interaction between any of them, between what was pointed out as warmth and light being levity, sound and life being gravity, anytime there's any interaction, their mother is there. And their mother is the akashic. 
And you hear a lot of people refer to that and they say, well, you can tap into the Akashic and basically it's zero point physics, the physics of a vacuum, that the vacuum around everything, because most everything is space, even in an atom, it's mostly space. And if you look out into the cosmos, it's mostly space. In that space is recorded everything that happens there. And that is the Akashic realm. And so that is the element that even with the modern theories of everything, and in the back of this book, or in the basically third, fourth part of the book, I list basically the evolution of understanding of the ethers. And right now, the very best theories that I know that are theories of everything, either refer to etherons or uh, the luminiferous, luminiferous ether, or all the, uh, the valence ether, they refer to ethers. And so modern science is now in an attempt to understand everything, put it in perspective where the ethers are the central core factor that everything is built upon. And that in fact, as I just pointed out, the, the uh, three dimensions that we're in, the fourth dimension, uh, and then the uh, transference of those into higher dimensions, all happens with the ethers. So if you can understand the ethers, you can understand a cosmology that will actually be able to hold water and can become a theory of everything. Wow, there's a lot of questions I have in regards to all that. <laughs> um, so one thing you were saying, like the concept of the ethers, obviously it roots all the way back to like the Hindus or Vedas. And I think there was something I was listening to you talk about and you mentioned something called tattvas. Um, what, can you, what is a tattva? They're ethers. That is the oh, basically okay. the Hindu understanding of ethers. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then so those, they kind of go into the different ethers as they call them tattvas and kind of give descriptions in their texts. Is that the case? Yes. Oh. And there's a great book, but it's a very, very dangerous book by Rama Prasad called um, uh, Nature's Finder Forces, where he shows that every 20 minutes we go into a new cycle of one of the four ethers. And this has now been shown as um, some of the most uh, amazing research. Um, they're called magnetic flux transfer points. These are places in our atmosphere where the uh, astronauts would look out and they'd see these brilliant flashes of light that would happen for just a moment. And they couldn't figure out what it was. So they launched four satellites and they've been watching now for four or five years. And basically now it has proven one of the theories that Rudolf Steiner put forth. But again, Rudolf Steiner was clairvoyant. These weren't theories. This is something he perceived. He said that the sun is being pulled, this, excuse me, the earth is being pulled behind the sun on a cable tow, on a rope. Well, these magnetic uh, transfer flex points are in fact where a magnetic rope for a moment and instantaneously, it doesn't take eight minutes for this to happen, instantaneously, the magnetic magnetosphere of the earth connects with the magnetic magnetosphere of the sun and is pulling us, tugging us behind the sun. That's true with all the planets. In fact, the outer planets, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are a little bit different. They have a, a larger, domain that this is happening in. But the inner planets are being pulled by these cable toes. So they started to analyze this. And what did they find? They found that because they can now measure uh, magnetic influences. And it's strange, but when they first started discovering this, they found it uh, about it uh, because they were listening to planets. And they found that the closer you went to the pole of a planet, the, the louder the sound would happen. And so sound, sound ether accompanies gravity or uh, coherent electromagnetism. And it, but as we said, you have to have warmth, light, sound before you can get to life ether or gravity. And so we are being pulled, not, uh, first off, as I'm sure you know, we don't just spin around, uh, rotate around the sun. No, the sun is moving towards a point uh, Vegas or uh, a point in the in uh, our galaxy where the planets are then pulled behind it. And so they've done computer simulations once they took all of the observations of every type of telescope they have, as well as uh, physical 
uh, visual observations, combine them and push the button after the analysis. And what did they find? That the sun is pulling the three inner planets on these cable toes, these magnetic cable toes, and they are following in a limnus gate behind the sun. Of course, this is like 600,000 miles per hour. Uh, and as they're pulling, being pulled by these cable toes, there's a limnus gate that is being made by the three inner planets. And then there's a larger limnus gate being made by the outer planets being pulled by the sun. Rudolf Steiner predicted this in his astronomy course. And he said, not only did he predict the exact location of the galactic center and the supergalactic center, he also predicted that the center of mass of the sun is not on the sun. It's in a dynamic point in between the sun and the inner planets being influenced by the outer planets, but it's in between and it actually moves based upon where these planets are. So the center of mass of our solar system is not on the sun. So something is pulling the sun forward also. And uh, that then of course adds to the tremendous speed that we're going as we basically plummet through uh, the cosmos at, towards uh, a point that for some reason seems to be drawing us. What, the, what caused that the Big Bang Theory? I don't believe in the Big Bang Theory. I believe that's complete nonsense. Uh, I believe in periods just like a caterpillar goes into a chrysalis and turns into this completely chaotic, what we call prolea, afterwards it comes out in a completely transformed nature. Well, that is what's happening. A, a, a pulsing of levity and gravity, a pulsing of manifestation and non-manifestation. And this pulsing is also the same pulsing that happens with the warmth and light ether, with the sound and life ether, all being contained in the Akasha. And what have they found out now? That at the edge of our solar system, what is it, 50,000 degrees, I believe, uh, they found, and they, can, uh, they don't know how to get through this. Uh, the um, spacecrafts that we've sent out there are, are finding it very difficult, and they, uh, as they start to go through this realm, they have a name for it, but of course, these names change all the time. As it reached that, we found that we are inside of a bubble, some type of a elongated bubble moving towards this uh, uh, star in the sky, and that the sun has this impetus to pull the other planets behind them. Well, essentially, in the ancient Hindu philosophy, in the Vedas, uh, in the Upanishads, it says that even beyond these ethers, and they will call them five ethers, uh, and sometimes they don't even include Akashic but they say that the Akashic is there. What is it that created them? What is it that created uh, Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu and their consorts, their, their female consorts? That is a being called Vak, V-A-C. In other words, the entire universe was spoken into existence. And this is why when you get to the sound ether and you start to have sound that is coherent, that creates form, then that creates function and function creates force. Once you have those through warmth, light, and sound, you can get to the life ether. The life ether is also called the word. And the being, this goddess, uh, she's called uh, in Buddhism, Prajnaparamita. She has many names in many different religions, but she basically, uh, Ilmatar in the Norse uh, mythology of the Kalabala, many names. When Vak spoke, creation came into existence. And so when we speak, we have this, um, what, this is the indication of our intelligence. This is how we take thought and turn it into something that can then communicate to beings outside of ourselves. This is the same thing that's going on in the cosmos. And so much that I'm describing here is only, it's, it's limited to our consciousness with our brain bound consciousness or our heart bound mind uh, to only see basically to the edge of our own solar system as we were, we were now finding out. And then beyond that, it's almost inconceivable. And when you talk about super, uh, 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 in the center of every galaxy is a supermassive black hole. And now every single year they rename the opposite of the black hole as the black hole is of course congealing 
and you they've now discovered they say they've discovered einstein's uh, gravity waves at the same time they go through a breathing pulsation process where they extend out ionic jets those ionic jets have more energy than the entire galaxy and they don't know what they are they've given them so many names i i could reel them off for you but basically you see them in pictures all the time when you see the dish of the galaxy and a supermassive black hole in one instance and in another instance these incredible spiraling conical ion jets that are producing they literally produce millions and billions of stars so instead of sucking stars into the supermassive black hole and by the way our own galaxy has one of these and it's in that stage when it reverts and becomes a manvantara instead of a pralaya in other words that stage of contraction into unmanifestness into basically nothingness because no one can tell you what's in a black hole when it starts to expand it creates this ion jet and the ion jet spins out billions of stars so when people tell you that the stars are created in the same way by simply the Kant Laplace theory of um, motion that turns into warmth that turns into light that then turns into a burning sun or uh, a star as it were that is nonsense uh, they are basically ignoring what we now can see with our own eyes happening in every single well-formed galaxy 200 billion of them uh, in the cosmos that we're able to track at this point, which are ion jets and supermassive black holes. That's the same thing happening with the ethers, but it's the same thing happening in your heart. The same exact thing happens in your heart and your heart produces, uh, I, you know, uh, at least a hundred times more energy than your brain produces. So consciousness is not in the brain. The brain is a mirror, but the consciousness that we have is in our heart. And those processes are again, little understood. There's a vortex rings that the new science of the heart is to look at the frequency of the vortex rings every single year they discover more vortex rings inside of the heart which they never saw before these vortex rings work at a specific frequency and they only discovered them a few years ago and now that is going into uh, an entire new science where they can uh, basically put a watch like a watch on your wrist and they put them on the, the points that they do, uh, you know, uh, Ayurvedic uh, pulse diagnosis. And they leave it on there for 24 hours, put it into a computer, and they can tell you, which a doctor can tell you this even when you're born, is your heart at the right angle? Is it too far forward? Is it too far back? Is it too far to the left, too far to the right? And by what the variable, there's a variable uh, heart rate, it's called, the variable heart rate can tell you what you're going to die of and when. So when we're talking about VOC, the voice, this is the same thing that's happening in your heart. And when we're talking about uh, at least uh, two of these vortex rings in uh, each side of your heart, and now they believe there's dozens of them, when they tune into those, they can predict your health. And that is all determined by your consciousness. It isn't determined by physical material things. It is determined by consciousness. So when we're talking about the cosmos or we're talking about the human body, they both have the same elements in them. They're the both, both of them have the same laws that um, construct them and maintain them. And they are in fact, one and the same. We are a, the hieroglyphic monad as it was called by John D, but basically a three-dimensional hologram that is the exact substance of the cosmos that we can perceive. And mind you, we can't really perceive the cosmos very well. It's a matter of guessing as soon as you're beyond the rings of Saturn. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. It's like next level heart science right there. And the patterns of nature are definitely fractal and repeated throughout various systems and processes. And, I'm glad that you'd also brought up that uh, Steiner uh, astronomy course, because I think that that's something that not a lot of people are aware of, even that are into Steiner, at least I wasn't until I had heard you mention that. Um, and the center of mass concept that you brought up is really fascinating too, just to 
kind of help people wrap their minds around how that works. Um, I wanted to kind of go back to when you were talking about. L let me like, add because oh, you, you you you're a smart guy. So if you go to the astronomy course, you're going to find some other great revelations there. Steiner states in the astronomy course that the frontal motion of light is all they is all they measure. But once light reaches a destination, it creates a continuum and can go infinite speeds. So there is no fixed speed of light once it has reached a specific destination and that the sun itself, as it emanates light, of course, it emanates warmth, light, sound, and life. And uh, the sound and life, as it comes into our atmosphere, become terrestrial sound and life, but there's, there's extraterrestrial sound and life, and that's the sixth and seventh ethers. So Steiner pointed out that, and this is well known now, that um, the breath of the sun, the solar breath, goes out to Saturn, turns around and comes back. But it comes back as sound, as magnetism, as electromagnetic frequency. But we can see the warmth and the light of the sun. We can measure even the warmth. But the light of the sun goes to Saturn, turns around and comes back. And the light proceeding from the sun and the light returning from Saturn meet. And that's how spheres, planetary spheres are created. That's how the Earth was created. And that the sun is not underneath its surface, just a big ball of uh, uh, glowing, uh, of, of burning gas. He said, no, what they will find out is that when you're looking into a sunspot, you are seeing the inside of the sun. It's not a black hole, he says, it's a white hole. And that now they've proven this, that you know the temperature of the sun is about you know, 10,000 degrees, but solar flares can you know be 20, 25, even more, depending on how big they are. But once you go inside of a sunspot, it's cold. The sun is not a big ball of burning gas that gets hotter the further down you go into it. So he said these things. Now, what have we found out? In lasers, they've been able to accelerate light beyond the speed of light in multiples. Uh, we know from the solar breath that, in fact, there is a returning aspect of the um, substance, the emanation to the sun. As it reaches Saturn, it turns around, and some of those come back towards the sun. This is the two types of light. This is the luminiferous ether. And the luminiferous ether is the basis for all light propagation. But it's also, as even Einstein said, people don't understand that Einstein's, all of his theories... The a priori assumption is that the luminiferous ether is there. It's an a priori. He never, well, he does. Matter of fact, in the book, I point out the few places where he clearly states that it must exist or all of his theories would be nonsense. And then, you know, uh, his speculation of what happens to light as it accelerates is complete nonsense. We already see that light has the capacity to move at infinite speeds if it's in the continuum. So in that course, the astronomy course of Rudolf Steiner, and also in his course on uh, what's called the warmth course, both of those were given to Waldorf teachers so that they could understand these things, so that as they taught students, they wouldn't teach what I call, and what he calls, superstition science. Because superstition science is nothing more than a new mythology. It might as well, and because of settled science, there's no settled science. Any theory of the scientists have been supplanted after usually less than 100 years. Hardly anything still remains today that has yet to be disproven by simply observing our cosmos within the realms of our own solar system. All the rest is sheer speculation. But just observing what happens in our solar system, most every theory, uh, particularly physical theories or astrophysics or uh, physics itself, can be disproven. Uh, for instance, there's cold fusion. Well, how can that be? There's cold fission. They actually happen in the human body. How can that be? That would go against the laws of uh, thermodynamics. But once you read Steiner and you understand Steiner, then the, the world, the whole cosmos becomes a living being and the interaction of beings. You, there's nine hierarchical beings, but then there's also elemental kingdoms and elementals. There's the ethers and there's the etheric formative forces, which you mentioned at the top of the show. And those 
etheric formative forces can be worked with and they can give us infinite energy, renewable energy that isn't based upon destruction of substance. Because what is science? Science is simply, uh, it, it's, um, it's an analysis and Anna means to kill. You know, a scientist wants to study a plant, they rip it up by the roots, they burn it and they look at the substances. Instead of looking at the way the plant grows, falls back on itself, grows, falls back on itself, grows, it, it goes through a pattern of manvantaras and proleas, manifestation and non-manifestation. And in the seed is that word that I was talking about. That is the life ether. And you must have warmth, light, and sound before you can have light ether. And where do you find life? You find it very rarely in the cosmos. We have yet to find it hardly anywhere else besides within our own domain here. And even then, who can define life? And now if you look, look at um, NASA will tell you that they can levitate water, they can levitate things through sound or uh, photoluminescence, they have all kinds of names for it. So they're tapping into levity, but really the question isn't how did the apple fall on his head? It was how did the apple get up there? That's what has to be asked. We have to look towards instead of entropy, and that the cosmos is a clock that's winding down, we have to look to ectropy, a name you never hear. As a matter of fact, when they call it's, it's, it, you have to have a negative to refer to a negative to get a positive in the realm of, uh, of superstition science, which has now become basically, as Rudolf Steiner calls it, a papacy. It, it, they think, the scientists think, that everything's their settled science and that any new theory doesn't really throw out the old theory. That was just part of the evolution, complete nonsense. First than the mythology of the Greeks or the Egyptians or the ancient Hindus or Persians, their mythology was much more accurate than many of our theories nowadays. And they had a theory of everything and it's called a cosmology. And because we don't have a cosmology, we have all of these different branches of science all being separate. They do not communicate to one another because if they did, and when they do, for instance, with genetics, when genetics meets anthropology and history, we're able to go, we're able to go and look up a mythology about an ancient city in India called um, uh, Varanasi and find exactly where it is by doing blood samples on people, going out into the ocean where it was said it was, and then they find the city. So we can start to have a synthesis of all of the different discoveries, not theories, but discoveries. And when we look at them with an open mind, we'll find that the wonders of the ancients are not silly uh, tales and mythology. They are in fact, clear descriptions of cosmological elements of beings and forces. Absolutely, yeah kind of blows my mind how people dismiss a lot of the ancients so easily when they seem like a lot of it they had right on point and I think that's awesome that you brought up that principle of ectropy because that's something that people need to be more aware of and superstition that science it's kind of like that scientism thing is definitely a real a reality unfortunately <laughs> um I wanted to ask you uh the these mon mon von trias or what, how you called them. Um, are these like uh, time cycles related to what Steiner had referred to as epochs or is that a different sort of thing? There are small prolias in between the ep epochs, yes, or the ages or uh, the incarnations of the earth, he calls them. There's a lot of names for this, depending on what, um, who you're studying, which ancient philosophies you're studying. And yes, uh, Steiner gives, you know, the, uh, of course, there are the 12 division of the Platonic year, 25,920 years it takes for the procession th uh, of the equinox, the uh, equinoctial point. You know, yesterday was the fall equinox, but in the spring, if you look at the position of the rising sun, it will actually in 72 years move one degree backwards in the zodiac. So every 72 years, it goes one degree. Every 25,920 years, it goes in the complete cycle through all of the zodiacal signs. And uh, 
each 2160 year cycle is an epoch as you're talking about here so there's the ancient indian epoch the ancient persian the ancient uh, egypto chaldean the ancient greco-roman and now we're in what's called the fifth epoch and it started in 1413 and will go 2160 years and they are actually ruled by sub um, sets that are ruled by specific, if you believe in these things, archangels. And uh, each of these hierarchical beings has a job. Uh, Aristotle called them uh, the categories. And they started off with quantity, quality, relationship, space, time, being, uh, and suffering. But actually, it starts with suffering also. So the fact that you can even observe anything. Perception is a type of suffering, according to him. So there's these 10 categories. Science has not moved from the first one. First off, they haven't figured out suffering. If they did, they'd be good Buddhists. And they'd understand that, you know, suffering is only time. It's in time and space, not in duration, and not in timeless and not in spacelessness. So you start off with suffering, you go to quantity. So science will say, we, we need to have a number, measure, and weight. And they'll even do that for atoms, though nobody really can tell you what an atom is. It's all sheer speculation in terms of modern science. Uh, we could go into that one too. And, and I, I, ha I have um, a very strong opinion about what an atom really is. Uh, it's called a monad, uh, the primal monad, according to the ancients. But science is still stuck at quantity. Science hasn't even gone to the next step of quality, let alone relationship or uh, space, time, being. And these have different names. You know, um, they're called, in the Bible, they're called uh, principalities, dominions, sons of fire, sons of the twilight. Um, they're called uh, love, harmony, um, dominions. There's, there's many names for these nine cate uh, categories, which Aristotle gives it a 10th one called suffering or being. And it can be debated whether the top one is suffering or beingness. Um, but science, mythological, uh, basically uh, secular humanism science, believes that the only thing that matters is human perception. And because we have limited perception at this time, they can't get anywhere beyond killing it and measuring it, weighing it, and finding out how it dies, not how it lives. And when there are discoveries about quality, then that's going to tell you about the nature of ectropy, the nature of levity, the nature of the beingness of substance. So yes, you're absolutely right. In between each one of these periods, there is a resting period. And even within them, there are subsets of 360 years of, at the end of which there's a transition. Uh, and then as we go um, from sign to sign, like now we're in the age of Pisces, and, and in the past, we were in the age of Aries and so on and back all the way to India and then even to Atlantis. And for instance, Atlantis, ask a scientist or an archeologist or an anthropologist if Atlantis existed. They would have to be absolutely naive to think that there wasn't a proto continent in between America and uh, Britain at, at the bottom of the Atlantic. You can actually look at the landmass that's there and it sunk. And as the continents pulled apart, it sunk. It isn't hard to figure out. And if you look at the fact that there's pyramids all over the world and people don't know that, there's 20 pyramid cities in China and none of them have been opened. And so it had an original source. And if you go to basically the Indian Ocean, uh, you can find that there was another uh, another continent there called Mu. Uh, they will now, they've named these things uh, in terms of giant ages of geology, but they don't actually believe it for one moment. Matter of fact, most geologists that tell you about these stages of the way that our geology uh, was laid down, take them aside, ask them if they actually believe that, and they'll say, no, that's absolute speculation. It's just imagination on somebody's part to come up with these theories because they really don't know. And in fact, how do we know that the, we know right now that the uh, rotation of the earth is spinning? Well, 
if it has been increasing over time, that means in the past, a day was longer, a year was longer. So when they refer to giant periods, which the Hindus, I think you're also referring to the, uh, the Kali Yuga, for instance, started in 2000 BC, excuse me, 3000 BC, and it went for 5,000 years to 1899 or 2000 BC. So for those 5,000 years, the ancient Hindus called that the dark age. That was the Kali Yuga, the age of darkness, when human beings lost their ability to perceive out of their heart and their solar plexus and got caught up in just thinking that the intellectual mind is all that there is. Now we've entered into a new age, uh, according to the Hindus, called Satya Yuga, the age of light. And so we see amazing discoveries like these revelations of Steiner's in his astronomy course happening everywhere. Is anyone correlating them? Is anyone creating a synthesis? No, because they don't have a cosmology. They don't have a theory of everything that makes sense. And if they did, then basically you're going to sit back and relax a little bit more because you're not going to think that you're rushing to your cold, gray, dark grave where there's nothing after life. And you will understand that life is a cycle of living and dying and that human beings have repeated human uh, incarnations, not as animals, not metapsychosis, and not even the Indian philosophy of reincarnation. This is repeated human incarnations on the earth. And this has to be, any normal mind would be able to derive the fact that why is one person born with tremendous, say, paraplegic? How is it that they have the same chance and opportunity for their consciousness as someone who's born completely healthy? And why is it that some people can come in, sit down at a piano and play it without any training? Why do some people have capacities that cannot be explained? This happens all the time. Where did those capacities come from? But because science doesn't believe there's anything beyond the grave and there was nothing before birth, then they're so limited. But in the realm from the earth out to Saturn, human beings expand out just like the sun in our emanation in our life. And then after life, we come back and gather the, the very forces that are the same thing that's happening with the sun with its light that goes out to Saturn and then the invisible light that comes back to the sun. And when they meet, they create a human consciousness. In other words, your head, your head is a reflection of the cosmos and your, the rest of your body is over a very long period of time turning into the same type of uh, spheroid and carbon in our body is being transformed into uh, basically uh, transparent carbon, C60, C70, C80, all of these things are in the cosmos. And when they come to the earth in a meteorite or through Shungite, which some, most people believe that was a meteorite, in the cosmos, we already have the perfected carbon that we are to become. When will science start to awaken to the fact that a human is more than a hairless monkey? Amen to that. <laughs> As above, so below, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Where do I want to go with that? Well, I want to finish up my last questions about the ether um, because I wanted to get you to kind of talk a little bit about how they relate to like, say like imagination or inspiration or those different aspects with like the light and the sound ether. And then after that, we can kind of move past the ether. And then I wanted to get into some questions about like meteorites and stuff like that. You have great questions. Great questions, because actually you immediately went to the beingness of the ethers in the human being. That threefold nature you just mentioned, thinking, feeling, and willing. This is our seat of thinking. Feeling is in our heart and willing is in our limbs and the things we do. Well, light ether is in thinking. And if you take sense-bound thinking, physical, earthly, sense-bound thinking, you will never rise up to higher thinking. But when you do, you create, you create ionized particles, which we can talk about at extreme lengths. Uh, you find it in, these, in, in this book and in some of our other books. Again, they're for free. Uh, we aren't selling anything. Uh, we are supported by uh, philanthropic um, 
people who work with us. And so you can read about these things. There's a transformation of carbon in the human body that literally transforms thinking into what Rudolf Steiner calls imagination. Now, this isn't just imagination or fantasy. This is when your thinking becomes so real that it's consequential. Then there's feelings. Well, this isn't just your emotions of like and dislike. These are the emotions that drive your passions. These, this is the seat of inspiration. And inspiration is, is the sound ether. Because inspiration is speech. It's, it's, turning in, it's, it's sound that is turning into speech. And when you enter into your will, we actually, most of our thinking is in words. And when you tell your body to do something, you're usually giving a verbal command to it. And that's what the will is all about. So thinking, feeling, and willing become what Steiner calls higher forms of thinking, feeling, and willing. He names them imagination, inspiration, and intuition. Now, when you get an intuition, by its definition, it is true. So when a human being has an intuition, 100% of the time, it's true. Well, how does that happen? Um, uh, Joseph Chilton Pierce, a good friend of mine, of course, he's passed over the threshold now. He was really into the Heart Math Institute. And what they do at the Heart Math Institute is they take pictures and they flash it of different, different objects on a screen before people. And they do this with, they've done it with th thousands and thousands of people. And pretty soon, once they get used to this process, a second before that picture flashes, they can tell you what it's going to be. Though they have, you know, 10,000 pictures and they run these people through it, it never repeats. Your heart knows what's about to happen. But your willpower, that's in intuition. When intuition comes up, it 100% knows. That's how you can do remote viewing. That's how people can be clairvoyant. That's how in intuitives get their knowledge they're actually leaving space and time. They can look into the future, or it's not really a looking, it's a perception, which is a combination of all 12 senses. They're not just five senses, there's 12. When all 12 senses come together, you, can, you know what the future is likely to be. Now, it's never inscribed in stone. There's no such thing as predestination because human beings have free will and we are completely unpredictable. And just think of it, we are so unpredictable that we are given these capacities of the same capacities of the cosmos. And what is it that humans do with thinking, feeling, and willing, with imagination, inspiration, and intuition? They try to tell us that they know that God doesn't exist. I mean, that's the hubris. That's the pride of Lucifer. It, it's just incredible that human beings can literally say, I've looked around, I've done a thorough job, and there are no spiritual beings. There's no divine world. There's no God. There's no goddesses. There's nothing. There's nothing, and, and the cold, dark grave is all we have to look forward to. Well, that is a lack of imagination. Uh, so light ether comes to light in imagination in the head, which is basically what you carry over from a previous incarnation into this incarnation. And so you can look at somebody's head, just like with our Vedic uh, medicine, and you can look at their nose and the lines, and you can say, oh, oh look, he's got liver problems. Uh-oh, he's got kidney problems. Uh, look at this. His will is, is too overdeveloped. Uh, did, did. Well, why is it? Because it tells you your whole story there. But it's not the limit of your story, because you're creating yourself anew all the time. As a matter of fact, the pineal gland, they said uh, for, for a long time, you were born with these calcium carbonate crystals, and there's three types of calcium in the pineal gland. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, but this is what I'm talking about, transforming carbon. When carbon can penetrate into uh, calcium, it becomes calcium carbonate, and those crystals determine your intelligence. They used to say, because they do autopsies in people, and if you had Down syndrome or you were born uh, with very few mental capacities, they would find very few of these crystals in the pineal gland. Now, they have a name for it, uh, what is it called? Um, bionutrition and many other names, where for some reason we are depositing these into our pineal gland and increasing our intelligence in many people's cases. And in other people's cases, they just have the ones they came in with. And because we're drinking fluoride water, fluoride calcifies uh, in a very, very bad way, the pineal gland, and basically they don't develop these. So there 
there's a transformation that's happening with imagination, intuition, uh, imagination, inspiration, and intuition. They have specific characteristics. They are specifically um, work with not only the ethers, but they also work with elementals. They work with uh, the etheric formative forces. And you find that in these descriptions that the theosophist and Rudolf Steiner was an anthroposophist. You find these descriptions as the physical body, the etheric body, the body of life, the astral body, and the body of your ego or I am, your consciousness. So these four stages are actually starting off with warmth in your physical body. Without that, you'd have no life. And then they literally evolve along with the ethers through the light ether. Uh, through sound and life ether, through imagination, inspiration, and intuition, which are the three soul forces that we have. And then we have the three physical forces, the body, soul, and spirit. And then when you go into the spirit, there's also three components to that. And when you have all nine of those lined up, you're actually able to work with the nine hierarchical higher beings that manifest these etheric formative forces, these ethers, both from the past and the future, because there's going to be two more ethers that we'll be uh, absorbing into ourselves in, in distant, in the far distant future. And so, yes, you hit the nail on the head. And one more thing, every human being, as they have higher thinking, feeling, and willing, are ionizing particles. When you look at the aurora borealis, you are looking at the exact same substances that manifest in your body as you're doing this etherization from the heart to the head to deposit calcium carbonate there. And literally they are the same particle. They, they're hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon. And as they are transformed and ionized, that's exactly what creates the aurora borealis. And what is the aurora borealis? It is the earth becoming a sun. The earth is now emanating light through the aurora borealis, not, ever, not created from the sun, not taken from the sun, except that human beings digest it in ourselves, but it's coming up out of the earth. And those are in fact, a picture of human ascension. And this is also happening from your heart to your head. So a psychic, a clairvoyant can look at you and they can see if uh, the Tibetans call it the rainbow body. And they can literally look inside of these chakras and see whether or not what we would call these luminous lights kind of like the Borealis, uh, Aurora Borealis and the Australia Borealis, um, which is in fact a mirror of the Northern lights, the Southern lights. This is happening in the human body and below the heart would be the lower, the Aurora Australis, uh, the Australis Borealis, the uh, Aurora in the Southern hemisphere. And those are from the past. If you're gonna be in the present, you start in the heart and you develop it and you would literally see the analogy you'd see a mirror of that happening in the earth as the earth is becoming a star. And because the sun is in a process of becoming less of a sun over time, scientists would call that entropy, as the sun is turning more into a planet, the earth is turning more into a star. Just like as each human being is going through the process of ascension and development, they are turning their heart into the sun and they are transforming these uh, planetary influences that we would find in the chakras. But this is also very scientific. It's the highest yoga tantra. It's the highest teachings of the Upanishads. It's the highest teachings of the Greeks, the, of the Chaldeans, of the Mesopotamians. All of them taught the same exact thing. It's just that we're in a different time now, and we have to take all of those ancient ideas, transform them into something that can then be useful for people today. And as the, my friend the Dalai Lama says, you only need to know one thing, Douglas. Be kind to everyone. That's it. Purity will get you higher in the process of ascension than all the thinking of superstitious science. Wow. Simple yet so hard for many. <laughs> and that's I'm, that's fascinating with the Aurea, Aurea Borealis. I always kind of wondered, I was curious about that phenomena. Um, and then the stuff that you'd mentioned with, in regards to like, uh, the calcination in regards to the pineal gland, that's actually, that's something I had learned, uh, years ago from, I think it was David Wolf, um, 
And since then, I try to drink uh, pretty strictly like spring water, definitely at least not tap water. <laughs> um, so you had mentioned the pride of Lucifer. Uh, so this was going to tie into something else. I wanted to talk about um, kind of like Steiner's view, um, how he talks about like the tug and pull of the Luciferic force and the Aramonic force and Aramon being like that hyper material and Lucifer being that kind of like disassociative uh, spirit, the uh, whatever, and then like uh, Christ as the representative of um, like the human and we all have that kind of like Christ heart and that sacred individuality. Um, and so with like these two forces and tugging and pulling, I was curious if you could kind of like elaborate on a little bit of the dynamics with all of this and kind of relate it a little yes. bit more deeply. David Wolf was right. Biomineralization is where it's at. We must work on making our pineal glands basically um, what's referred to as the New Jerusalem or Tushita Heaven or the Seven Storied Mountain. There's a thousand descriptions for it. And it does come through nutrition. Without nutrition, um, my, my wife, who is a doctor, naturopathic doctor, Tyla, has created a diet, uh, an ascension diet. And one of the first things is you have to have good water. If you don't have good water, you're just not going to make it. You know, you, you can't have good life. So Lucifer and Armand, amazing again that you would ask this question. There are few, few people out there who have the interest uh, or the interest in these things or the capacity to understand them. But I try to make this simple because I've been a teacher for a long, long time. I was a Waldorf teacher for decades, Waldorf teacher trainer for decades. And what we must do for people is put it into a way that they can understand it. So here's the way it goes. Lucifer is that which pulls us out of our body. Araman is that which pulls us down into our body. One gives us an overabundance of life. And if you get too caught up in yourself, you think you're all that. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've met who said they were enlightened or that they weren't going to ever have another incarnation because they were so advanced that they don't have to have another incarnation. As far as I'm concerned, that guaranteed they'll have about a hundred more incarnations. Uh, and then Araman draws you down into death and illness and suffering, all the things that Buddha said you needed to understand with consciousness before you can start on the path. So Araman, and this gets really um, into a very current discussion, debate, if not arguments. Rudolf Steiner pointed out that cosmic wisdom that used to come through what he called um, atavism, uh, atavistic clairvoyance, or what we could call natural clairvoyance. I referred to it as the clairvoyance that comes from your solar plexus below your heart. And it's basically how you connect into the collective consciousness of your tribe, uh, your group, your nation, your folk soul, and all of those things. Um, we're supposed to have already worked out the lower chakras below the heart. So Araman, if you didn't work out how to control your love or hate for people who are your relatives and people in your environment in your solar plexus, if you didn't work out that your chi energy usually two fingers below the belly button. If you didn't work out your sexual desires uh, and get them under control, and if you didn't work out a foundational, basically uh, health so that you can stand upright, relate to people in a way that is not animalistic, relate to people with good energy and making sure that you're always in the flow of energy and being able to love all those around you no matter how much they betray you or harm you, then you're not ready to start your path in the heart and Araman controls you. And Araman is an ancient Persian god. Uh, he was called Angri Manu. And he, because uh, the good Manu is a very uh, wonderful being. That's like the Manu of ancient uh, Indian, who, uh, the Hindus who gave the, uh, the laws of Manu and was considered to be the Noah off of Atlantis for the Hindu people who went to Central Asia and then inseminated cultures of um, out of that Central Asian uh, center, mystery center, into India, into Persia, into Mesopotamia, into Egypt, into Greece. And even in our time, uh, you can be inspired by this being Manu. Well, the Angri Manu is Araman. Emerson had studied uh, ancient Persian and he all the time referred to, oh, Araman is really hurting my shoulder today. 
or you know, well, the fear of Araman, the fear of death is 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 what drives most most people. And so he understood people because he understood that Araman was uh, illness, suffering, old age, and death. And if you don't have those things worked out in yourself, then you're just going to be fearful and worried and probably fall to the seven deadly sins uh, all throughout your life. And then you'll end up in a cold, dark grave because you won't have life, much life after death. You'll, you'll be a materialist. If you're a materialist, you really won't expand out to the realm of, of Saturn after life. You'll only expand to the realm of the moon where what the Tibetans call the hungry ghosts exist. It's basically like a purgatory. It's like a hell. And if you can't get past that because you've worked out the negative influences of Araman in your lower chakras, then you really don't even have a chance for ascension. But if you can find your heart center, which is where your I am is, and you know when they talk about the blood of Christ and all this stuff, people get you know all freaked out and think it's all religion. No, here's the deal. The warmth in your blood is the basis of you having consciousness. And what is it that creates that consciousness? Oxygen, and in one aspect, comes in and through red blood corpuscles who only live for uh, a number of days and then they die and give up of themselves, which is like a sacrifice. So your blood is making a sacrifice for your consciousness at all times. Uh, that is really the gift of Lucifer. So in the fall of Lucifer from heaven, remember he was the highest of all angels, but his pride said he wanted to take the seat of God and be this luminous eye that no one can look at, kind of like, you know, us looking at the sun. You know, we forget how powerful the sun is and that everything on the earth comes from the sun, everything, and, or from other stars, according to mythological science. But Lucifer is seen as a demon, but that's not really quite right. Lucifer, the father of lies, is uh, not quite the same as Satan. Araman would be you could say that Araman is like Satan and Lucifer is in fact, this being of cosmic wisdom that wants to overwhelm human beings too fast. Araman is gravity and Lucifer is levity. Both of them are bad when they go to their extreme. You need both or you can't live and you should have developed your relationship to the earth before this incarnation, especially if you're living in the West where you have every opportunity to uh, develop great wisdom uh, through all the wonderful things that have now been made available for our study. So if you take in this ancient cosmic wisdom of Lucifer, then you have the capacity to keep rising up into the realm of the angels, the archangels, and the beings of time, and even beings above that. Because Lucifer was the highest of angels. He, he went all the way up to the top. He was there with what you might call the Trinity, which is above the nine hierarchy, and he fell all the way down into the realm of the human. Now, as Lucifer, through levity, is taking you up into this, what is called the earthly and cosmic nutrition stream from the heart to the pineal gland, and then it turns around and comes back down, and once you deposit a calcium carbonate crystal in your brain, it shoots forward through the midbrain and stimulates through uh, piezoelectric stimulation your pituitary gland, which has two parts to it, and you excrete uh, pituitrin. Pituitrin then comes down into your body as nutrition through the roof of your mouth, and it uh, stimulates and uh, revivifies. It, it basically renews your uh, blood system and your nerve system. So this is a process, a cosmic process. The Taoists have it as this cosmic, uh, microcosmic, macrocosmic, uh, cyclic process. And this can happen, but it doesn't happen um, constantly and all the time. It happens when you're having higher thinking, higher feeling, higher willing, imagination, inspiration, intuition. So in your thinking, you're going to find Lucifer. And Lucifer is going to tell you that you're all that. And Araman is going to help Lucifer by saying, here, pick up this device. It, you can look up anything online and it makes it look like you know everything there is. Oh, I can contact, I can send something out on Facebook like I do now and contact 750,000 people with the push of one button. So I'm omni, so I'm omni uh, present. I think that I'm omniscient. I know everything. 
someone says something like, oh, well, let me check that, you know, and I'll tell you whether you're right or not. Well, science says you're wrong. Oh, so I'm omniscient, Araman, this device, because Araman rules these mechanical devices and rules this physical plane even more so than Lucifer does. And then, uh, so you're omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. You think, like Rudolf Steiner said, in the future, and this was way back in uh, the early 1900s, he says, in the future, we will be able to push a button and make an explosion happen in a far away city in another country. We can do that now. We can be omnipotent. So we have the delusion of Lucifer and Araman right here in every one of our digital devices that can do these things. But what do they do? They steal your ability to think. They steal your ability to feel. They steal your ability to have intuitions. They eat you. So Lucifer is trying to eat you from one direction. Araman's trying to eat you from the other direction. And they, but they can't meet in the heart because that's where Christ lives in your blood. And the sad thing for Lucifer and Araman, who, by the way, will be redeemed in the future. There is no evil that's permanent. Once you reach the realm of duration, there is no evil. It's only in the realm of time and space. So they can't see Christ. They can't see your higher self. They don't think you have a higher self because they're trying to eat any part that is feeding to your higher self to this earthly and cosmic nutrition stream that I just have described. So Lucifer is, is levity and is coming down to eat your levity. And Araman is coming up from the ground to eat your gravity. And if they have their way, they will consume you and you will end up in a cold, dark grave and your consciousness will, will be minuscule and you will not have a strong consciousness after death that you can expand out to the realms of Saturn, basically giving the gifts that you have, just like with this uh, earthly and cosmic nutrition stream, we give our gifts to these higher beings. They are so happy and sad to say they too eat it, but they love eating it. And it's kind of like a cow eating grass or us eating good vegetables. That's what's supposed to happen. So when you have some good nutrition in your imagination, inspiration, intuition for these higher beings, they turn around and reward you. So the more inspired you are, the more inspired you will be. The more intuition you have and you learn how to work with it, the more intuitions you'll have. And the higher you can develop your mind in these imaginative realms, uh, which in many cases are abstract because they are not sense-bound thoughts. Most of everything I've said here is not specifically a sense-bound thought. It takes the capacity of imagination to even think these things. And the questions you're asking demonstrate that you do a lot more than just think about them. Obviously, they inspire you. And I think that your show, I, I looked at a lot of your videos and you have brilliant people coming on. And what are they bringing? They're bringing what they have as their intuitions that have inspired them to do the work that they're doing, which really is a process of uh, conscious ascension a consciousness transformation. So Lucifer and Armand, Lucifer incarnated in 2000 BC in this very city that I was talking about where Manu lived. Araman, according to Rudolf Steiner said, Rudolf Steiner said about Araman that not a day of the second millennium AD will go by that Araman will not be incarnated in North America. So all these people who think there's going to be the super AI that moves into the internet and lives forever and controls our lives, that is exactly what this being wants to do. And in fact, he's doing a great job. He is causing more depression and suicide in our children because they live by these things. They, it is eating us up. We have medical tyranny that is like a medical papacy where the medical doctors are giving out papal encyclicals that cannot be questioned. It's settled science. Vaccines are good, they'll tell you. Well, look closely at that and you'll find that that's not settled science and that simply because a human being says something, no matter how inspired or intuitive they think they are, it doesn't mean it's true. So we have this battle raging. So in the human heart where our mind exists, not our thinking, our mind, our consciousness exists in our heart, there is a battle, but that battle is also for the whole earth because the human and the earth are one. And the human and the cosmos are one. The human and the solar system are one. Our heart's the sun. Our six organs that are our rib cage are the uh, six other planets because really our solar system stops at the rings of Saturn, even though uh, three other planetoids have joined us. 
um, basically there's a battle going on and you can see it as Lucifer in one ear and Araman on the other ear. And they're always telling you different things, but you have to decide. And that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when you get the right answer, it will renew you. It will refresh you. It will give you spiritual divine nourishment, or you can just call it pituitrin, or as they called it in many traditions, the dew of the heavens. They called it amrita. They called it soma. All the descriptions are the same. It's a nourishment of the human body that is given by the work that you do to ascend from your heart into these higher realms. And you have to be aware of these two beings who want to lead you astray. Wow. Okay. Um, so as for Christ and his and that role or that archetype, um, and the you know, the popular biblical canon um, is concerned and the, you know, the Old Testament and then into the New Testament with uh, that event and all those things that have taken place and the history of all that. Not that it's, um, you know, the most important question, because I think it's more about the messages that are kind of derived from those things. But I'm just curious, what are your thoughts about all of that and the um like what what can we take from it um and benefit from the uh messages the biblical messages um and then do you yourself have any um personal uh, i guess dis disagreements with the general mainstream understanding of those uh biblical texts and the events that had taken place if that makes sense what i'm trying to get at i don't know oh yes i understand and you know um my wife and i we get literally untold amounts of requests to do interviews and when you started talking to me i forget how we started talking oh because brian told you about me and when i spoke with you there's one reason that I decided to do an interview with you, and that's because you have the right questions. You see, people who have all the answers, they have no space in themselves to take anything in. Uh, and you have all the right questions. And these questions today, I was really looking forward to them uh, because usually I prepare um, before I do a talk. But with this, I said, oh, I'm just going to go see what questions he has. And my wife said, well, that's kind of strange on your part. I said, no, no, no. He's got really good questions. So. I'm going to give you the long and the short of it. I was a Jesuit priest. I was a Benedictine and I was a Trappist monk. I had gone, uh, I was a uh, hermit because at different times in my life, I believed completely different things. And so one might say, well, then he's a Catholic. No, I'm certainly not a Catholic and I'm certainly not a Jesuit who are very evil. I didn't know when they told me I had to become a Jesuit that their hi history, I hadn't studied them. And, um, once I'd gone into the NSA and I'd gotten my fill of Araman, of the mechanical control of human beings that lead us to war and war within ourselves and war with other people and nations, I decided to basically, because uh, I had already been trained as a Benedictine, to go and be a hermit and try to do this process of ascension for the sake of all sentient beings. And that's what the Buddhists say. They say that everything you do should be for the sake of all sentient beings. And, and they say, um, I can give you the exact phrases, but basically, please help me get enlightened, not for my own sake, but for the sake of all other beings so that I can help them understand what illness, suffering, and death really are. And if they can get out of the realm of desire, and the, uh, then they can actually be free enough for themselves to approach enlightenment. Well, um, Fortunately, I would have to say that I believe that the time for all religions, and I believe in all traditional religions, but I believe in them the way that they were delivered at the time that they were delivered. So all traditions are true. I have studied with the Dalai Lama. I've studied with the highest Galupa, Sakya, Nyingmapa teachers. I've uh, studied uh, the fifth uh, Buddhist path of Bampo. I've uh, studied all the religions. I have a PhD in comparative religions and I have a PhD in philosophy and I have a doctor of divinity. So I was totally into religion when I was young. 
And then I found out being part of it, uh, really, that so much of it is nonsense. And it's basically male control over what used to be uh, the feminine domain. So the further back in history you go, anytime beyond 2101 BC, you're actually dealing with the remnants of a matriarchal system. That system has been in darkened. It has been squished. It has been, uh, they did everything they could to annihilate it. And who was it that tried to annihilate it? Male priests. But look at the Greek times. Where did they get their oracles? They were all female. Where did they get their inspiration? They were all female. Uh, you know, that's the reason that a, a, a woman uh, could be a pharaoh. They would put on a fake beard. So when we endarken the female and we make Eve into the Garden of Eden, evil woman who brought original sin upon us, that is simply a historic reality that the patriarchy had to annihilate all vestiges of the pre prior matriarchy. Now, I don't believe we should bring back the matriarchy. I believe that we have to evolve and we have to understand these things for what they were at the time that they existed. So personally, if you ask me, I have gone to every single church that I could ever uh, get into, <laughs> that they'd allow me into, and that's a lot of them. And I've been involved uh, at a very deep level in so many of them that it would take too long to describe that. I've been initiated into so many different spiritual paths that uh, one time I tried to make a list and at about 50 or so, I just gave up and stopped writing them down. Uh, uh, so I was an insatiable person trying to find the golden thread that runs through all religion, mythology, fairy tales, history, because I was convinced that there was one, and there is one, and we can call it Christ, or we can call it the higher self. We can call it um, uh, what's called manas, buddhi, and atman. We can call it so many different things. But the point is, all those religions are past. Now, for someone who is in that tradition or that religious tradition, it's valid for them if they have a pure heart. If they don't, they might be giving their power away to people who don't even understand their own tradition. You know, oftentimes priests and priestesses who don't understand their own religion. I don't believe in resurrecting old religions. I believe that we must understand the future. So the Old Testament is the story of Abraham. Abraham was the father of um, the Hebrew uh, Judaism. He was also the father of Christianity. He's also the father of Islam. And so the people of the book all go back to Abraham. Well, Abraham, in about 2000 BC or so, they can't quite pinpoint it, he was one of the first people to develop abstract thinking. And this thinking in the head was necessary to lead us into the materialism that we're in. So though I may rail against materialism, and tell you that you should go towards the spirit through ascension, it doesn't mean that materialism doesn't have its place. So all of these things have their place. So the Old Testament, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, fear God, the, the Ten Commandments, and the 184 different Has, uh, Hasidic Orthodox rules that had to be followed by uh, the true Hebrew people, they were valid at the time. Are they valid now? Only if you have a pure heart. Uh, same thing with Islam, same thing with Christianity, same thing with any religion, including the cults that have been developed, like Joseph Smith's cult, the Mormons, uh, Jehovah Witness cult uh, developed by the Barians, the, all of these different cults that now parade under the false flag of a religion need to be analyzed for what they are. And they all have good things. I haven't found any path, even, even one could even say Satanists if Satanism can lead you to the fact that there's Satan, then you will awaken immediately to the fact that there's angels. Now, won't you? Because if there's a devil, there's an angel. There's a God. If there's a Satan, there's a God. So every one of these paths is temporary. And it's part of a tradition. So I have been initiated uh, by the Dalai Lama in the, in, in, um, the Kala Chakra and the High Shukha Tantra by Gaelic Rinpoche and Ludinkin Rinpoche and all these people. And all of those things are valid. But for me, I study Rudolf Steiner's teachings, but I don't get into the cult of what he called, what he named anthroposophy. So I study his teachings. I study the teachings of all of these things. 
So the teachings of the New Testament, let's just boil it down. I went through the whole New Testament, found the words of Christ. And if you take out the parables, most of those parables already existed. You can find them in the Gospel of Thomas. You can find them in the Q document and in um, the, the documents of the Gnostics. But when it boils down, there's only one rule. Love God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. Those three parts we just described. And love your neighbor as yourself. It's the golden rule. The golden rule is found in every single valid traditional religion that I have studied that is on the path towards ascension. So we have to put it all in perspective. And when you do, you'll have tremendous appreciation for all of them. But it doesn't mean that you have to become uh, an Orthodox uh, Hasidic Jew. It doesn't mean you need to become even a Russian Orthodox or a Greek Orthodox or that you need to still stick with nothing but the Vedas, uh, or that you need to go to India and get a guru. I've met many, many, many gurus. When they get to America, they have the same challenges that you and I have of materialism. Many of them start to drink alcohol, eat pizza, and want to have sex with everybody and, and try to take their money. Okay, well, these are the seven some of the seven deadly sins. So if you simply go the path as the Dalai Lama said, which I said before, Douglas, develop kindness for all beings. That's it. Kindness for all beings, including yourself. You have to add that. Uh, that's the only teaching that is really valid in today's world, unless you're a scholar like myself who want to study these things to say, oh, well, let's specifically look at exactly what was studied in this year by the Persians, or uh, look into what Zarathustra taught, or what Scythianus taught, the Scythians, or uh, what Manu, the laws of Manu taught, all of those are valid for their time. But in our time, no one needs a teacher. No one needs a church to go to. No one needs a religion to go to if you take your own initiation into the higher realms of ascension under your own belt. Take it under your own motive force. So my wife and I wrote a thing called the Gospel of Sophia, and it spells out uh, what I'm talking about here that all traditional religions, when I was a Jesuit and I was getting a degree in comparative religions, I pointed out that in all holy scripture, they all go back to a God who's unmanifest, the Perlea, and the goddess who is manifest, the Manvantara. They all do. You'll find that in every single, even mythology, even in the Kalevala, Ilmatar was before the creator, Vainamoinen. Uh, you, you'll find this in, in all of even mythology, in anything that is valid that people really believed with their true heart. And what we need now is to understand that we are male, female, that we are Christ and Sophia, with that being of wisdom that in, embodied his mother. Uh, and we are the Christ who embodied Jesus of Nazareth for three years. We can all do that, but we can't do it on that level. We have to take it in incremental steps. So that's the path of the Holy Grail. So the Holy Grail is literally a religion that one can also follow. But you're going to find out there's 125 different descriptions of the Holy Grail in written tradition, uh, in extant works that you can study. You're going to get really confused. If you try to study one of these old paths, like Tibetan Buddhism, uh, the Kalupa tradition, which was where my first guru, uh, he was in that tradition, Gela Krimpache, he's the teacher of the Dalai Lama, you're going to get really confused because you can't understand the mind of someone who was living the laws of the Old Testament. And you can't understand the mind of the Christians who were the apostles and the disciples of Jesus Christ. Because if you did, you wouldn't need any Old Testament, New Testament. You wouldn't even need to refer to the idea of Jesus of Nazareth becoming Christ. You could simply focus on the fact that if you merge the male and female in yourself, wisdom and compassion, then you can reach the clear light of bliss. And that clear light of bliss is what happens once you do biomineralization, you deposit uh, car uh, calcium carbonate crystals in your pineal gland. It's automatic. You don't have to tell your pineal gland to shoot out a piezoelectric charge through your midbrain to the pituitary gland. It happens naturally because God and the goddess made a perfect human body that is the temple and you don't need to go into any other temple to find enlightenment. Amen to that. 
yeah. <laughs> well, I first, I just yeah, I want to. You had mentioned uh, a little bit while back, uh, you don't really like to get stuck or identify with the, the cult of anthroposophy. So at the beginning of this, I called you an, an anthroposophist. Uh, so, so I apologize for that. <laughs> oh, no, I, I was uh, and I'm a member of the Anthroposophic Society uh, at, oh, okay. at all levels. And uh, I love anthroposophy because if you understand what is anthroposophy, anthropo, Sophia, man and woman, wisdom and intellect merged. And so Rudolf Steiner knew, he didn't make up that term, uh, Thomas Vaughn, Eugenius Philalethes, and others used it. But what he was trying to say is, and he did say, I would change the name of my society every day if I could, if it would make your mind more flexible to be able to hear the language of the spirit and to commune with the divine world. That makes sense. Okay. Um, and then uh, like that thing that you had mentioned about the uh, sort of the end darkening of uh eve i like that i it's something that i've always thought was kind of interesting you know just prior to the decision of eve she had not yet conceived of good and evil so i that always was kind of odd to me um but yeah maybe i could ask you a couple more questions um before we wrap this up i don't know how you are on time so i want to be respectful because you've already given me a lot of my time so time doesn't exist to me sky you can go on as long as you'd like all right. So I want to get into the wisdom of crystals and metals and minerals a little bit. Um, crystal science is something I don't know very much about, but I definitely feel like there's a lot of secrets and or, you know, natural phenomena associated with crystals that have yet to be discovered or, or rediscovered. And I kind of wanted to see if you could maybe lend any insight into the magic or science of crystals and uh, how they can be utilized in any way, shape, or form that you might find interesting to share. I think my first book was uh, Crystals. The um, How was it titled? It's, not, it's certainly not in print anymore. It was a very long time ago. Uh, the Magic, the Mystery, and the Myth or something. Uh, when I was ch a child, I was born in uh, Springfield, Missouri, and my grandfather would go down to Arkansas to get the best crystal in the world, actually, uh, and many have believed that, in the Washita Mountains down in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And he'd bring back truckloads of them. And he built a crystal cave, uh, and it, it had water flowing in the bottom of it, and it came out into this beautiful garden. He had crystals all over. So I would sit in there and transcend. So I've been working with crystals. Matter of fact, I was one of the first people to go down and work with the miners. And because at that time I was very, what they call psychic, I had sensitivities. I could tell them where to dig to find the type of crystal they were looking for. So I know the Coleman's, I know Oak Stanley, I knew all, uh, all those people, all the miners. I loved them. I'd go down and hang out with them. They loved me and they'd give me crystals all the time. So eventually when I got old enough, I um, would pack up my van and every summer I'd go from coast to coast selling crystals to jewelry shops, to new age shops and stuff. So I was deeply involved in it. Now there's a lot of psychic hoo-ha all around this stuff. But what you really want to know is this. You take a crystal and you squeeze it, you put pressure on it, or you heat it, and it emanates, if it's a single terminated crystal, it emanates from that point, and they can grow out both sides, double terminated. And if it's what's called a single, not a twinning crystal, it will emanate a stream of piezoelectric energy. This is not mythology. This is the mechanics of crystals. When you, in, in a watch that's driven by a crystal, they take a little crystal uh, slab and they put it in a vise and they bend it so that they enhance the 32,768 vibrations per second, I believe it is, that a normal quartz crystal emits. That is a magical force. Without silica, first off, carbon is the ruler of all organic life. Inorganic life, trees, rocks, minerals, the crust of the earth, that's all silica. Uh, the human body, when you're born, uh, at the moment you're born, you're over 90% silica. As you grow older, it turns into calcium. In other words, you calcify, and that's the reason why you grow old, get sick, and die. Silica is levity. Calcium is gravity. So one could say silica is like that forces of Lucifer in a way, and that's the reason there's so much Lucifer craziness around crystals. And Araman are 
uh, are the opposite forces of calcium, which uh, calcify you and kill you, make you sick, make you ill. And only when carbon comes in between and transforms that calcium in through a silicate process and goes up to the pineal gland, do you actually have the transformation of silica into human silica. And that is a truly magical substance. Now, um, without silica, we wouldn't be able to stand up. Silica created our bones, it creates our skin, our hair, our, most of our uh, teeth or silica, and then they, they're filled in with calcium, uh, dentite it's called. Uh, and so basically we are a being that exists between the realm of silica and calcium with carbon in between. And now it doesn't matter how big the crystal is, a tiny little crystal this big, if it's a double terminated crystal, is as powerful as one as big as your house. And I have uh, demonstrated this more times than I can count, where I have, you know, I'm wearing a crystal and somebody says, ah, that's complete nonsense. And I say to them, ah, oh, let me guess, have you ever had a dream? I guess you haven't. And the person will go, no, I've never had a dream in my whole life. And I'll say, mm-hmm, yeah, right. What if I told you, and I, I always carried crystals with me, lots of them. I always had a bag ready to give them out to people. If I take out a little tiny double terminated crystal, I said, put this under your pillow and you will dream tonight. And they go, you're full of it. Every single time they dream. And one time a person I was working with had put it over on his uh, dresser drawer and he didn't keep it within three feet of his head, which I told him, keep it within three feet of your head and you will have a dream, even if you've never had a dream in your life. And so his daughter came in and said, you cheated, dad, it's too far away, put it under your pillow. He had a dream. Now, this is the, imagine, this is the uh, absolutely incredible thing. Once he had that dream, he any more. That was scary. I, I got to see all this stuff and he told me this incredible dream, right? And it's like, Whoa. but you see, those are the people who believe that a crystal is a dead rock. But if you're a person who's already very imaginative, for instance, I had someone come who filmed us the other day for a documentary they were doing, and he is a camera guy. And he's saying, you know, all this stuff you're saying, listen, my big dream is to dream in colors. Can you help me with that? I said, oh yeah, that's really easy. He goes, really? I've been trying with everything. Uh, I put crystals around me. I got all these, and I said, no, 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 no. You have to have a crystal that has uh, a refraction in it, uh, an inclusion that, that, that already emits color. So you look at a crystal and some of them very kind of rare, but when you look at a standard quartz crystal, and it's really nice and clear, but there's one, it's called a planar inclusion. And when the any light hits it, it comes off in a rainbow color. So I went and got one for my collection and said, here, take this, put this under your pillow tonight and tell me what happens tomorrow. And I didn't go into great detail. Uh, and he came back the next day and he goes, oh my gosh, I have to thank you. I dreamt in full Technicolor last night. It was the most amazing thing. Uh, <laughs> and this is a guy who deals with taking pictures in color, and he was obsessed with color, but for some reason, he didn't have that little stimulus in his brain and in his silica in his body uh, to make that happen. So can crystals heal? Oh, yes. If you take a double terminated crystal, matter of fact, I was one of the first people to uh, develop this. Uh, this would have been back in uh, the early 70s, late 60s. I would take double terminated craters crystals and put them on the chakras and other special places that I could see would energize the body. And then I'd take a crystal wand, a single wand that had very clear uh, single point, not uh, twinning or not a double terminated. And then I'd take a double terminated crystal or a sphere in this hand, and I would simply go and touch them. People had the most cosmic experiences, they would tell me, of their entire life. The weight of the crystal stimulated it, the exact, even if you stimulate a crystal, it's still going to em emanate 32,768 vibrations per second, but it will cohere any other energy coming into it. So if you have stress, 
if you are involved in any of the seven deadly sins, or if you haven't developed your heavenly seven virtues, then you're, it's going to be locked in your body somewhere. And as that comes out, as the stress comes out, as they go into a deep trance, because these crystals will put you into a trance if you lay them on your chakras lying on your back, uh, these people would then have cosmic experiences. And as I would touch them, of course, I was working with them. And then afterwards, I would say, well, this is what I saw. And it would be like their most intimate, deepest secrets and this kind of stuff. But this is what they came to me for, was to have a laying on of crystals, kind of like laying on of hands. So they can heal. And it doesn't matter how big they are. Keep them close to your head, and they will be effective. Uh, matter of fact, I have never seen this not be effective with somebody now, do you need to have a thousand crystals like I do? Matter of fact, you can see a bunch of them on the shelf behind me. Uh, no, that's because I'm obsessed. <laughs> and do I need that? No. As a matter of fact, that's I don't fun. carry a crystal on me anymore. I am a crystal. I am that vibration. Uh, and then when I get sick and, you know, and I'm stupid and get into all kinds of horrible stuff, then it's more the calcium taking over. But that's what crystals can do. Now, Silica, silicic acid is the basis of most of the precious stones that we have uh, in, in most cases, except for diamonds, which are carbon and uh, corundum, you know, but in the different colored stones, precious stones, those are metals and minerals that appear there that cause the coloration. But it's really the silica that's making them very lively. And that's the reason the kings and queens all knew you had to have this stuff up on your head. And yeah, you make a crown of crystals and it will put you into um, gamma waves in your brain. I've done this. We've experimented with it, with the devices that can actually, you know, because people don't believe me. I have to prove this now and then. So I made one of these with copper tubing, crystals wrapped in a certain way, put it on the head. Boom, super learn learning happens because um, not alpha, beta, theta, delta, no, gamma. Gamma causes all the other brain waves to cohere. And then you go into super learning, but that only lasts for about 20 minutes. And then you have to do it yourself. You have to take that impu impulse and learn to control it, make it yourself. Okay. So the metals and the minerals, the metals relate to your organs. So gold relates to your heart, tin relates to your uh, uh, liver, lead relates to your spleen, um, uh, uh, on and on and on. Anyway, so the, the organs in your body, as I've mentioned before, your sun is your heart and the six organs under your rib cage, those are all controlled by metals. I've actually been taught through a Rudolf Steiner form of, met, of um, what's called uh, limnoscate, limnoscatory massage or rhythmical massage, how to do certain rhythms on an organ using a metal that is in the cream and it heals people very quickly. So, so rhythm, uh, limnoscape, because that's, you know, that's the motion of the planets following the sun. It's also this, this motion here, as you, this uh, nutrition stream I talked about is a limnoscape. And so you can do that with metals and those relate to your organs, but you can also make metals into homeopathic remedies and you can take homeopathic gold and it's good for your heart. You can literally take homeopathic lead and it doesn't poison you because you dilute it so much that the original substance is no longer in the 26th or 32nd dilution of it. Uh, nothing but the etheric, like the ethers. So the etheric nature of that metal is in it and you can use that. You can also take a crystal, put it in water, a colored jar of water, or just clear. If it's clear, you're gonna get the energy of quartz. But if you put it in a green bottle and you put it in the sunlight, you will actually get the same kind of energy you'd get from an emerald. And this has been demonstrated and proven. And it's, you know, you can uh, feed plants with it when you do that. And some metals will harm the plant and some will enhance its growth and so on and so forth. So studies have been done on all of these things. It's not a mythology. And this is the kind of science that science, um, secular science would never ever do any research on. Um, uh, there's a guy named Vogel uh, who did all this research who I knew. And he proved that if you take a, a, a quartz tube and put it in a spiral and you run water through it, when it comes out the other end, it's super ionized, super oxygenated, simply by running it through a tube of quartz crystal. So crystals, metals, minerals are actually the secret to healing the physical body where plants 
as the Bible says, the leaves of the trees, also its roots of this bark, uh, are for the healing of the nations. So minerals and plants, and then um, the organs of animals can also be used in conjunction with plants to create other seemingly magical substances that also heal. And then, you know, you can heal yourself by food. Yeah. All right, back in business after a brief uh, interference due to the weather. Um, we we're just getting deep into the science of the crystals and got kind of cut off, but um, I'm not really exactly sure where we were at. Um, but I did have a question related as you were going through a lot of the stuff you're talking about with the crystals that that question was uh what is double terminated when you were talking about double terminated crystals well double terminated are my favorite because they're the most energetic and they're super healers so this one is a natural double terminated it grows out this end that would be the normal termination right but if you flip it over it's also growing out that end uh, it's not actually the best one to show that one this would, this would be a little bit better. Okay, see this crystal here. Uh, you can see that it's got a termination point here. And if you flip it over, it's got a termination point here. So it grows out both ends. And so there's energy coming out this end and this end. So a double terminate is automatically a twinning crystal or more than twinning. Um, so when they take a, um, the old days, all the radios were all based upon crystals, right? They take a slice of a crystal, and as long as it was a single terminated and non-twinning crystal, they would be able to tune all frequencies related to the exact emanation of 32,768 vibrations per second. Um, and like with the watch, every time that they record that there's that many vibrations, that's one second. So you want a crystal uh, in terms of emitting energy very, very consistently to be single terminated but if you really want to look at the body it's kind of like your chakras aren't just single terminated they you know you got multiple layers in the chakras part of them are older petals some of them are new and then you got the physical etheric astral version of the chakras so if you lay a double terminated on any part of your body where you have a chakra it makes it spin automatically and so i've been collecting double terminated crystals i uh, for a long, long time, because I found that they were the most energetic. Wow. Okay. And then my other question was, uh, when we were talking about uh, kind of like the metals, you were talking about how they can kind of relate to the different organs. And I was wondering, for the heart, um, I was thinking like the sun heart, uh, would it be gold or would it be copper that was associated with gold. that? Gold. Yeah, okay. copper is for the kidneys. Oh, okay. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the lungs are mercury. Um, spleen is lead, uh, uh, liver is tin, um, what haven't I mentioned here, uh, the skin and uh, is silica, uh, particularly. So yes, uh, each of the metals, not, not every metal has an associated organ, but the major ones are usually the major um, metals that you would find. And then what about iron? Uh, iron, of course, is in the blood. Iron is what causes us to be able to take up oxygen. So the iron in the blood, so the, uh, the uh, heart and pulmonary system is basically directed by iron. And, and uh, that's one of the things that the current illnesses are stopping and causes um, hypoxia is the inability uh, for the red blood cells to through iron to take up oxygen and then to take carbon dioxide uh, uh, out of our body and it is iron working with zinc that causes uh the best uptake of oxygen into the red blood cells wow all right well, i'll just uh maybe ask you like a couple more questions um the one thing i did definitely want to get your thoughts on before we closed out um i think i had heard you mention something about meteoric yeast or meteorites containing some kind of yeast or something like that. Was that correct? Yes, yeah, science has now found the discoveries of uh, yeast and they can't figure out how yeast can continue to grow uh, and live 
without dying when they come from meteorites that have been in cosmic space. But uh, some actually speculate that that yeast is the basis of uh, DNA because yeast can turn things into sugars and sugars look like DNA. Well, there's also galactose, which is a form of uh, sugar that is found suspended in ethanol uh, clouds in the cosmos. And at one point in our, uh, in the aspect of the spiral nebula that we're in, in our galaxy, they passed through uh, these giant clouds, which they know are there through, uh, you know, uh, spectrometers. And they basically will then speculate that that's where human DNA came from. The lactose is almost uh, identical to mother's milk. And of course, sugars are uh, the basis of uh, building our DNA. So there are yeasts that are found um, on meteorites now, and it has opened up an entire exciting new study for the scientists. Wow, that's fascinating. All right, well, um, are there any last thoughts or any messages that you would like to put out there and share with the audience before we wrap this up? Uh, I just want to uh, underscore, reiterate what I said before, Sky, the more and better questions you have, the more interested the spiritual world is in you, in us. And so there's always the ever-present help of beings above us, just like when we are helping children. You know, uh, if you have a good, pure heart, you can't help but help a child who is in need. And we have to believe that, that for us as human beings striving for ascension, that there are going to be spiritual beings who will be there to help us in every step of the way. And in our book, Gospel of Sophia, um, my wife and I uh, describe these beings and give uh, explanations of them and also give you a path of initiation that is a self-generated path of initiation that is equal to any of the paths of initiation that I have uh, had tremendous great teachers in many traditions, uh, many religions teach me. And so we synthesized all that down to show uh, and give a path uh, that you choose because there's not just one path there's many paths to learn the language of the spirit and um, this book the gospel of sophia is a trilogy and the three different books first off describe the morality training that you need so that you can enter into the spiritual world because without highly developed morals uh, you can go into the spiritual world but you will come back and you won't remember anything but if you can go into the spiritual world and cross the threshold and you can become then inspired by these beings. And an inspiration is something that happens maybe only in a second, but that inspiration can last you the rest of your life. So we have to give credit to the fact that this cosmos is built out of great wisdom. Matter of fact, those beings are called the beings of the Kyriotides. And the beings of Kyriotides are referred to in every tradition that I know uh, as a Shekinah, Inanna, as Isis, as Sophia, uh, Anthroposophia, many different names. That being is always ready to help you take the next step in your spiritual development. No matter what it is that you're doing, you can be uh, a deadhead scientist who uh, you know believes in superstitions. But at one point, you may um, you know stumble off a sidewalk, and the benzene ring appears in your mind, as hist history tells us is exactly how it happened. Or as Tesla said. He would see these things in his mind as living substance, and then he would go and apply it. And, you know, he's the greatest inventor of our times. So all of us are worthy of receiving that help if we put out the effort to do so. And the way to do that is to question everything and to seek truth. And then that truth, through the knowledge you've gained, eventually through your experience, that knowledge can become wisdom. And that is the being of Sophia. And that is the reason we called our books, The Gospel of Sophia. So I salute you. Uh, and uh, you're one of the few people who's ever gotten to me without going through my wife. And I, uh, I said to her just now, uh, no, we're gonna get back on and finish this. Uh, so we have you know, a nice rounding off at the end. And I said, you know, honey, the reason I agreed to talk with Sky is because he had the best questions. When, we, when I talked to him before, he had a list of these questions, and I was so anxious for that because it is very, very rare. And she said, oh, I heard what you guys were talking about. And uh, yes, he must have had great questions 
uh, for you to uh, uh, spout such profound things uh, from the teachings that I've studied. So thank you. Uh, and I thank Brian uh, Leto. Maybe he'll get to hear this. He is one of my dearest friends and uh, an amazing being who is in direct contact with the elemental world through uh, biochemistry in Hawaii. Uh, and I highly recommend that uh, people see anything you've ever done with him and that they go to your site because your site has just fantastic stuff on it. You've interviewed fantastic people and I'm just honored to be one of those. Well, the feeling is definitely mutual. Um, appreciate all of your work and you sharing this time today and i would definitely love to reconnect at some point and do another one because and i could probably talk to you all day and yeah so this has been absolutely amazing and inspirational for me uh personally um so with that uh, is there any last place you'd like to direct to the audience to learn more about you um well we do have blogs my wife runs aimfortruth.org a-i-m the number four truth.org and from that and other sites like our spirit and she's also on gab she just tells me from across the room uh, she's all over the place uh, but if you want the spiritual stuff you can go to o u r spirit dot what is it honey dot com and you know i take all my orders from my wife because i'm smart <laughs> and thank you again Swag. yes indeed you send me some more questions and i'll be thrilled to see if i can come up with some answers excellent all right well thank you again Have a good thank night. you blessings <laughs>